Hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of Paratalk and on this episode I've got something completely different. Now you may or may not have heard of this channel, Old Scary World. It's um it's a mixture of everything and I have got the host of that channel with me on this episode and we're going to talk about some uh, some strange things. How are you? You going okay? I'm good, thanks for having me. Good, good. Um, so, old scary world. Uh, I think the first thing uh, we should do is let listeners know what that channel is all about, really. Well, during the lockdowns, you know, with the um, with the uh, pandemic and all, I um, I'd always had a lot of knowledge about the old world and about the esoteric and the paranormal. And my wife actually encouraged me to share that with the world because before then I had only shown it in conversations with friends and so forth. And so I did a little research into how to start a YouTube channel and how to grow on Instagram. And so I started Instagram and started YouTube. But I was primarily motivated by this emerging topic of the old world and mud floods and, and Tartaria, this lost civilization. So what I did is I, I make music. I've been making music for over 20 years. So at first, the channel was just pictures, just slideshows of, you know, um, Mysterious looking pictures, old world ruins, uh, ancient civilizations, ancient artifacts. And I would put my ambient music, my dark ambient kind of music to it. And it actually took off. I got a thousand subscribers within a couple of weeks and the views just kept going. And then YouTube said I could be monetized. So I did that. So I was making money off of them. And then I started talking over them. I started narrating them, zooming in on the pictures and just kind of dissecting the old world and trying to figure out where our civilizations arose from and then looking into cataclysms and uh, catastrophes that may have wiped them out, such as Atlantis, such as Tartaria, Hyperborea, things like that. And then it also just kind of played into my long-standing interest in the paranormal, which I've had since I was a child. And so, yeah, that's how the YouTube channel started. It was basically just because I wasn't working and I was in a position to do such a thing. And, and I'm just really glad that I did it because it was a good time to start because there was a lot of people home getting into this kind of stuff because, you know, their own you know, probably was probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. I think um, you, you've you've uh, kind of mentioned something there that kind of uh, is in line with my kind of thinking. And when we had the, when everyone was at home uh, and, you know, just wondering what to do i was recording podcasts and writing scripts and putting shows together and it, it kind of motivated me to say i've got this time and i want to use it the the best i can rather than just sit and play video games although i did do okay. that but you know um and i also noticed that uh over that period of time that everyone was literally at home uh when well not everyone but you know um, that that there was a, a kind of a burst of YouTube videos and content was being created, and and I I noticed that you know that the, the the ghost videos people were putting up more stuff, and 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 did you notice that that over that time that you know grew it grew and people were sort of getting more sort of um in a way creative. I absolutely yeah I saw a huge explosion in the interest and not just the consumption but the production of uh, paranormal, UFO, conspiracy theories, all that kind of stuff, it really exploded because people finally had time to digest it. It wasn't just something in the background. And um, yeah, a lot of people experienced uh, a lot of growth 
during the last two and a half years, for sure. And uh, also people's minds opened up a little bit more because they had time to decompress and be a little bit more open-minded towards those types of things. And it, I think it's something that's going to stick around. I don't think it's going to really shake off. I think some people have gotten really uh, enthralled by it, so to speak. And I don't think that their interest is going to wane now that maybe they're going back to work or getting back to their day-to-day -day life. But regardless, I think some people are permanently altered by that absorption of uh, such information. Hmm, that's true. I mean, it's it does make you think. So, you've you've got your channel and you've built up a following and you you're creating content, but this all had to sort of start somewhere. So, I always ask this question: When you were younger, um, a child growing up, uh, did, wh when did you first start to become interested in you know peculiar things? Probably earlier than I can remember, technically, but. I'd say my earliest memories of you know being interested in in the, uh, the spooky and the uh, the paranormal. Honestly, about six years old, about six seven years old, I would say for sure. And, and when was your kind of first experience? Well, around the same time, um, I actually saw what people refer to as the Hat Man. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know about the Hat Man? Yeah, yeah, cool. The Zorro kind of hat, yeah. So I was about I was about five six years old. And I was here in California. I stepped out of my bedroom into the kitchen. It was almost sunrise. It was kind of like the uh, twilight kind of time, right before the sun, you know, comes up. So uh -huh. it, was, it was it was still dark, but it was that very ethereal time. It was that very almost kind of phantasmagorical time, you know. And um, I noticed this figure standing in the kitchen, and he was probably about seven feet tall, honestly. It was very tall, and he had slender form, and then he was wearing the hat. You know, he had the tall, not like a not like a top hat, but like a Zorro hat. Yeah, yeah, white, yeah, yeah, with a white brim. And he was just standing there, where I presume his back. And then I like stubbed my toe. I remember, I hit my. I was I was trying to be quiet, but I I hit my toe or something, and I made a little bit of a noise. And he turned around and, you know, so there was this like conscious, you know, acknowledgement of each other. And then coincidentally, the sun kind of, a little light started to come through a little bit. And then uh, when that light hit him, he became less opaque and he became more translucent. And then he eventually just kind of drifted off. And I told my mom about it a few hours later. I went back to bed. I was really scared, but I went and I told my mom about it, and she dismissed it and all that kind of stuff. And then I saw him a couple more times throughout my life, but it was never that vivid. Yeah, that was probably my first experience with something like that. And I still I still remember it very vividly. Yeah, I, I was going to say that um, I've read a few uh, books and accounts of children that uh, experienced this, what, similar to what you've just relayed, where they, they, they come like face-to-face -face with figures in their home uh, you know, the, uh, from nowhere, we call them, I suppose you could say, like shadow-like people, you know, apparitions, I suppose, in a way. And so it's uh, it's interesting that I always think that when you're a child, maybe when you're a child, you're, you're, you're more open, you're more susceptible to things like that so that you can tune in to stuff like that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, I've looked into that too. I think that that's true. I think that children have, for whatever reason, their connection with the the spirit world or just the um the supernatural in general it's a little less um it's a little less corrupted by the by you know adult life or adolescent life even and then also we're not scared as much because we don't fully understand what's happening whereas if you're an adult and you've been kind of programmed or you know conditioned through horror movies and fiction to, to have a certain reaction when you see something unusual, but when you're a child, it's just different. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I mean, children, I mean, I think back, we were all children at one point, but I can remember being a, a young a, a young child and not really having any fear of anything because my understanding of those kind of things was uh, quite limited. But I think that, as you say, we you, night terrors and, and nightmares and stuff are when you think back what influences you as a child to to experience those things when you haven't been watching horror films and and all the stuff that adults do you know and it's uh, it is interesting so moving on a little bit 
from your early years to your sort of uh, what we say our, our next step is our adolescent sort of teenage years. Did you find that when you got to around being a teenager that your your thought process and your outlook into the unexplained, the the supernatural, did it change in any way? No, I wouldn't say it changed. It just became more intense. It became more, less of a curiosity and more of a hobby or more of part of my personality in the sense that when I started, you know, to go to parties, I was the the child or wasn't a child, but I was the teenager. I was the kid who knew about conspiracy theories and, and religion and, and all that kind of stuff. And I would talk philosophy and, and theology and I guess technically a little demonology and so forth. And this was the 1990s. Yeah, there wasn't a widely availability to the internet. So a lot of people just kind of found me interesting because I read books about these things. I had to read books and a little bit of internet in the, in the beginning, but um, no, my perceptions didn't change. It was actually just intensified and it became more a part of my personality. And just how I looked at the world, it made the world more interesting to to believe in those things. And not just because I wanted to be scared or because I wanted to be interesting, but because I genuinely believed in it. I've always believed in it. And my father, he was a bit of a nutter. And he um, he always encouraged that kind of stuff because he believed in it too. And he told me about all kinds of interesting things. And so as I grew up with him, I was raised by him and my mother. You know, They, they were still married up until the day he died. And so we always had paranormal research material. We had, he was a book collector, so there was all kinds of interesting books. And we had Bibles and Qurans and Torahs and, you know, Talmuds. I mean, we had all the religious texts in the house and I was homeschooled. So I wasn't discouraged from, from spiritual education. Uh, so I, I kind of got the best of both worlds in that sense. So, so yeah, I mean, the 90s, um with the very, very beginning, I suppose, of the internet. Uh, and it was, you know, I, I, I remember getting access to the internet in the late, I think it was, must have been, yeah, the, the late 90s. And being able to go on to, I think back then it was just forums. You would go on to a forum and, and, and read stuff and, and you'd pick up ideas and stuff like that. And I think some of the early people that, you know, the pioneers of the internet that would go on and, and you say post stuff and come up with ideas and thoughts and stuff. That that was the kind of grounding. In in essence, you had to read books. You had to go to the library. You had to get books out of the library. If you wanted to learn about ghosts or anything like that, you'd have to go and get a book and read a book and educate yourself. When Like today, it's all different. You go to YouTube and watch a video for 10 minutes and you kind of, everything is condensed. So when you were younger and when you were growing up, did you sort of get to this kind of stage where you wanted to go with your friends and you know let that house down the road is haunted let's go and investigate it where, where did that come from where you sort of went from reading books and learning about stuff to actually physically going out and doing stuff well technically it was before that because when i was a kid before i started reading those, those kinds of books but those kinds of advanced books um like i said even as young as about seven eight years old i was going out with my friends and looking for those kinds of places yeah and we had heard from some, from an older kid, or, or just by way of chance, we heard about how a Polaroid film was supposedly a, a better way to capture ghosts. So my friend happened to have a Polaroid camera. He's upper middle class, so they had a lot of film laying around, and the parents didn't mind that we were using it. And we would actually ride around on our bicycles, and we would go to all the places that we thought were scary, like there was a there was an old mansion that was all decrepit and run down with ivy growing all over it. So we took pictures of that outside. And then we went to uh, a creek and did some tunnels. And we thought, well, there must be ghosts in here. And so I was already doing that before I started reading, you know, advanced books about it. So, and we had pictures that we thought, you know, we had ghosts on it. And we would go around telling all the kids, all the other kids that this house was haunted and that house was haunted. I just, I just loved, um, telling ghost stories, not because I was trying to scare anybody, but because I, I, once again, because I believed in it and it was just something that I was passionate about as a kid. I thought it was really interesting. So yeah, I was actually investigating, then reading, and then going and investigating places that I couldn't go to when I was a kid because of distance and time. So 
yeah, I mean, I've been to abandoned hospitals that were built in the 1800s. I've been to um, abandoned factories where people, you know, had had industrial accidents. Just anything that was like a magnet for the for that kind of paranormal type of stuff. And then also, um, you know, a few haunt, quote unquote haunted houses and things like that. And uh, yeah, and um, so it's actually it started with the exploration as much as I could do when I was a kid. What was the um, the most scariest one? What was the one where you <laughs> you went and you thought, you know, I've bitten off a little bit more as I could chew here? Well, well, the scariest um, encounter I had wasn't even in uh, a building or, or a haunted house. Right? It was actually just um, right on the street. What happened was when I was about 16 years old, I was walking home at about... Um, I think it was about 1 a.m., some, somewhere between 1 and 2 a.m. And this experience is actually what solidified it. I mean, I had already believed in it. I was already, you know, not dismissing it. But this is this is basically my proof, although I don't have any evidence other than my own, you know, recollection. But what happened is, is I was walking home, and I turned the corner that I turned, you know, thousands of times uh-huh. before. And you know how it is when you are used to a, a certain a certain point, you know, a certain vantage point, everything looks the same. So if something's a little off, then it really sticks out. Yeah. So I turn the corner and I'm walking down the sidewalk and I notice about halfway down the block that there's this huge uh black circle in the in the sidewalk that's never was never there before. So I say, Well, that's kind of weird. But I thought, okay, it's a shadow or something. So then I get about twenty feet away from it and I noticed that it's completely opaque it's completely black and there, but there's no light around it in other words there's nothing casting a shadow it's just black it's just completely just absence of light that's just absorbing and so then I noticed that there's these figures these four-legged figures and the best way I could describe them is they looked kind of like an Irish wolfhound like with a high arched back. Okay, yeah. And they were also shadow like. They were completely black. They were they weren't two dimensional, but they weren't quite three dimensional either. They almost looked like they were cut out of cardboard, but completely black. Was and this a were... nighttime or daytime? This is yeah, this is between one and two AM. Okay, early morning then. Yeah. Middle of the night. And so these things they look like they look like beasts, they look like little creatures, little four legged creatures, but they had a high arch back like I said, like a like an Irish wolfhound. And they were going around the circle, around and around the circle. And no light was shining off them. They weren't reflecting any light. And they were just... And the circle was about two feet around, about 24 inches in diameter. And it was in the middle of the sidewalk. And so I just stopped. I, just, I, was, I was immediately just like frozen. And I was just watching. It was very hypnotic. And I was thinking like, oh, is this really happening? This is, this is, it's finally happening. I wasn't scared. I didn't want to run away. I didn't want to turn my back, but I was a little apprehensive. Obviously, I didn't want to go up and touch them. I mean, in hindsight, maybe I should have. Then yeah. who, knows, who knows what would have happened, right? So I'm just watching it. I'm like, wow. Like, I'm kind of in shock, but, I, but I'm, I'm, you know, I couldn't blink. And then the house that, was, that this was happening in front of was an old Victorian an old two-story Victorian house. And then I feel like somebody's watching me. You get that feeling like you're being watched. And there was an open window. There was an open window, but it was all black. There was was no light on. The whole house was was dark. And I hear this noise coming from that room. It was to to up and to the right of me. And the only way I can describe it is it was like um, it was demonic, and it sounded like an owl screeching, and then also kind of a, a human kind of rasp. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to reenact it at the same level. But just so your listeners understand the gravity of the situation, I'll, I'll kind of demonstrate at a lower volume. But just keep in mind that it was very loud, like uh, as loud as um, as almost as loud as a siren. So it was kind of like. <laughs> and it had like I said it had this owl quality like a like a barn owl 
And then also had this quality of like a human. So it was like a, a human owl, like if you could imagine like a biped owl. So I'm guessing that hearing that you kind of turned around and, and went the other way. No, oh, no, no, no. Uh, I was determined to figure this out. So I just stood my ground. I looked up at the window. And like I said, I felt like somebody was watching me from that window. I go back and I look at the beast going around the circle. And now they're, they're hopping. They're hopping into the circle. They're leaping into it. There was about four of them. And one by one, they start leaping into the circle and disappearing into the circle. So now I'm getting kind of, you know, I'm starting to get a little bit more. Yeah. I wouldn't say scared, but I'm starting to say, okay, well, now, now what's going to happen? So now the guy is up in, up in the house. He's screeching. And the things are showing me. It's almost like he called them. It's almost like he gave them that, that screech was a command to go into the hole. And now the hole is spinning and the, the creatures are jumping into it. And then eventually the last one jumps into the hole and it's it's over. And so then I look up at the window and it's it's quiet. No more screeching. So I run over to where the hole was and I'm tapping on tapping on the on the pavement. Yeah. And nothing's happening. I'm stomping on it. Nothing's happening. So I immediately, I, I, I kind of look back at it a few times as I walk away from it, just kind of bewildered, just in shock. And so I go home, I write it down, my account, I write it, write it all down in detail. And I had a hard time going to sleep and everything. I didn't even live that far from where this happened. This was only, it was only about a half a block from my home. So I just said, well, you know, I, I got to get on. I can't, but I go back every night, of course, for a few weeks, you know, to see if it happens again. Of course it doesn't. And then interestingly enough, interestingly enough, these people had a, um, they had a moving sale. They had a, they had a you know, a, a, what you call in, in, in Britain, a uh, sticker sale or a tag oh, sale. Oh, like a, a clean, they have a, they have like a yard sale. Yeah, except yeah. they were moving. It okay. was, so it was, it was technically a moving sale. So I said, wow, okay. So I go, and there's this woman, and she's the wife, I'm assuming, the mother. And I'm asking some questions, and she seems very very skittish. And uh, I'm like, okay, whatever. So I go over to the book section, and there's all these books about uh, paranormal. So I said, oh, great. You know, So I'm picking out some books I'd like to buy. And there's books about witchcraft, and there's books about um, demons, all, all the all the stuff you'd expect. Nothing too archaic or antique or anything, but just kind of you know standard things. Yeah. And so I'm picking out some ones I'm interested in, and she's just watching me the whole time. So oh, this is kind of weird. And then this man opens up the front door, and there was a, a porch up the stairs, so it's like a raised porch and big Victorian porch. And I see this guy, but I only see his eyes. I don't see he's kind of just leaning out and he stares at the woman and then um, kind of gives her like a dirty look. And then he gives me a dirty look. And I think to myself immediately, I go, that's the guy that was hissing at me. That was just the the feeling I got. So, so at that man, point, you started to put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't like me. He probably recognized me. And I said um, to myself, I said, I got to get out of here. I said, um, so, but I was still curious. So I kept looking through the books and then I noticed that there was books about alcoholism, like how to deal with an alcoholic, how to deal with a drug addict, books about spousal abuse, <clears throat> uh, books about uh, domestic violence, <clears throat> excuse me, and then books about um, how to deal with um, like finding, finding uh, love through faith. There's a hodgepodge, but basically the, 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 the story that it told was that the man was an alcoholic, drug addict who was into the black arts and um, yeah. was abusive to his wife and so forth. And so I, I didn't buy anything. I felt like the books were cursed. I didn't, I think, feel like it, the books were a trap. So, so you, I put yeah, you could have bought something and taken it home and uh -huh. your life may never have been the same. Right. So I decided not to give them any money, not to exchange anything. I put everything back. And uh, the woman, 16 years old, I didn't yeah. know what to do. And I was a little intimidated by the ritual that I had, you know. So what I, what I think happened is I interrupted an incantation. 
Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so then they left. After the moving sale, they, they moved, and I have no idea where they went. And uh, I've, I've told this on another podcast. I told this on a on Upstate Unconventional, which is another uh, paranormal podcast. And I'm going to say the same thing I said on his show, which is that by any chance that that individual is listening to this podcast, I, I'm, you know, I hope you got better. And um, I, I don't apologize necessarily for interrupting what you were doing because I don't approve of such things. But nonetheless, I, I hope that um, I hope that everything got better in your life. And I, I, know, I honestly mean that because that was terrifying. It was actually more terrifying now that I think about it as as a, as an older person. What kind of situation was going on underneath that roof? I I honestly believe he was doing drugs, and 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 summoning demons. So, do you think that um, by taking drugs opened a kind of a was try open a gateway to, you know, to manifest or to uh, bring into being something by uh, opening the mind, sort of thing. Absolutely. I, I strongly believe that drugs, um, narcotics and, and psychedelics and all those kinds of things when used improperly or with intent to create destruction are, are almost alchemical ingredients. They're almost like disposable um, material that you use. And also we know that drugs are synonymous with self-destruction and the lowering of inhibition. So if one is under the influence, they can kind of let go of that of that self-survival mechanism and they can go down a darker road yeah. with less apprehension. And we also know that the practitioners of black arts have long used drugs not only to, you know, induct people and get people hooked on drugs to keep them in the cult, but also to expand their mind in, in those directions, whether it's with uh, amphetamines or with hallucinogenics. Either way, it's, it's also part of sex magic. Uh, you know, the consumption of narcotics during sex magic. I was going to ask you, um, with, when you had this experience and it was all over and, you know, you a months passed, five, six months passed, how okay. long did it stay with you? How long did it stay in your mind? Has it always been in your mind? Have you ever gone back there, like, in recent times? Um, yeah, I mean, I continued to live in the area and once they were gone, it, it never happened again. And I think about a couple other less um, less intense experiences, and it was probably connected to that, just strange noises and uh, some things, you know, but nothing that intense. But it all stopped when they moved when they moved away, it all it all stopped. But I, I think about it, yeah, very often. Whenever it would come up in conversation, everybody would be talking about paranormal type stuff or ghost stories. I would tell that story and you know, I wasn't trying to I wasn't trying to one up anybody, it's just that was my best story and so everybody was very impressed by that and there was people who who said if that's true if that really happened then there's absolutely something to the paranormal and i said absolutely there is well yeah i'm i i have this conversation quite a lot with individuals in various walks of life and uh i it it, it, it niggles me a little bit sometimes when people sort of boo poo stuff and say oh it's that's too fanciful that could never have happened. And yet when you look at the world and you look at what people experience from all around the world and some people experience some very bizarre things, not every one of those people could be making it up. They are experiencing something. Uh, whether it's um, an internal projection, whether it's something that they have, you know, that they truly are witnessing, something happening on our planet, um, I don't know. I don't have the answers. But I do think that things like that are going on all the time. And it's just that we either don't notice them or we're not, you know, as I say, you're walking home, it's early in the morning, it's obviously very quiet, and you stumble into this. And it's something that the likelihood of you, someone else being there uh, early in the morning, it, you know, chances are and it's not going to happen. But the fact is that if you're alone walking through the woods at night and you see an apparition or something, uh, you know you've seen something, but you try to relay that to someone else and they'll think, oh, well, you were drunk drinking or you, you imagined it or whatever. So I want to move on a little bit because it takes me on to um, hauntings and haunted houses. Because you've experienced something like that, 
what are your thoughts on uh, hauntings and ghosts that uh, allegedly are, are haunting a premises or a, a place, a home or whatever? What are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts have always been, and I, I'm open to different theories, but my I would say the thing that I adhere to the most and that is just displaced energy. In other words, like you hear, it's kind of a cliche or it's kind of a standard explanation, but I think it's the most standard because it's probably the most accurate or it's the most easily to prove through history records is when you have suicide, when you have homicide, when you have some some trauma built up in that house, you know, a lot of abuse over the years, um, an untimely death, a violent death. Um, I think that that energy is is stored in in there. And then also we talk about curses. I, I believe in curse land as well. I think certain real estate is just, um, it's cursed. And, you know, if you're unfortunate enough, and it, it doesn't always affect the same people in the same way. You know, it could be a bad uh, string of uh, relationships. It could be uh, a poltergeist. It could be apparitions at night. It could be uh, bad water. One of the things that my dad taught me, he said, if you want to know if a place is, is quote unquote haunted or cursed, is have some of their water, like from their well, okay, from their pipes. Yeah. And if the water, if the water's foul, then the land is bad. And it could be the person, or it could be some some built up energy like that. But as far as hauntings go, yeah, I I, I think it's a it's a matter of of energy. It's a matter of the that um, paranormal build up of um, of trauma. And then I think that sometimes, just to put it on the other side of the coin, I think that sometimes there's a benevolent ghost. I think there's ghosts that are trying to help. In other words, they're a blessing, not a curse. And if you're lucky enough to live in that kind of a, a locality, then you might have a more fortunate. In other words, I don't believe in luck. I don't really believe in bad luck or good luck. I believe in blessings and cursings. To keep it simple, all ghosts are those of people that have lived before do you sort of run by that line or do you think there's something more to it do you think that uh, there are forces out there that like to mimic and pretend that they are <laughs> someone who might have lived before just for the hell of it mm -hmm. absolutely yeah i think that there's genuine spirits who are once human and then i think that there are um demonic entities that have always they've never been human in other words, they've always um, their their sole purpose is to is to imposter and mimic, and that they they were never human to begin with, and um, like not even lost souls. Like a lost soul would be a human who who lost his his way on the spirit road or on his way to heaven or hell or whatever abode you uh, believe in. But yeah, no, I think that some of these entities are purely malevolent they're pure evil and their whole uh raison d'etre is is to create misery i have a friend um many years ago he went to a party and uh this was in the uh the sort of height of paranormal tv shows like most haunted and ghost hunters so everyone was you know doing the ghost thing and he went to a party and at the party it was, a, it was a great small group of people, six, eight people. Uh, they had a Ouija board and they were kind of, let's do the Ouija board. Let's talk to the dead. And he didn't really want to do it. And he was kind of thought that he had to be part of it just to, you know, have a few beers and, and do it. And they did it and they didn't really get any luck until the very end where the, the planchette moved, started to move on its, uh, you know, apparently on its, you know, under some sort of force. He did had enough of that, and he decided, I don't want to do this anymore, and left. And, of course, everyone went their own way. And for a number of weeks afterwards, each one of them was plagued with bad luck. So do you think that there's a, a connection between, you know, playing with the Ouija board, not really knowing what you're doing, and getting some bad luck? Well, absolutely. And there's a few things that I won't do. There's a few things I haven't done. And that's one of those is playing with the Ouija board. I've always heard from older people 
don't mess around with, with, with the Ouija board. And so there was a few instances where um, some kids brought one and I left. I just removed myself. I said, I don't want to be a part of this. Yeah. Um, there's just certain things that you don't do. And there's um, there's a couple of things in my research that I regret. And there's um, things I wouldn't uh, recommend. But at the same time, for the sake of your podcast, for the sake of information, or as a, as a precaution, I will um, strongly discourage the Ouija board. And also I will strongly discourage um, the reading of a certain book. And you can look into this. I, I, I strongly just... Um, I, I strongly discourage reading it, but the name of the book is The Unsacred Rites of the Koton. Mm -hmm. And this isn't reverse psychology or anything. I know it might have some type of effect on people, but it's more to say that if you do come across it, do not read it. Because I read it and I had some experiences after reading it. And then I gave it to somebody who wanted it and they're in prison. So were those experiences, were they overly negative or? Yes. And, and they, did they, they impacted your life in a, in a serious way? Temporarily, yes. So, for example, we, we've got, still got TV shows now and you see people going out to all the haunted locations with uh, all manner of uh, technology, which wasn't around 25 years ago. Uh, do you think that uh, this is a, just a, a modern form of carrying a Ouija board around? Is it still, are you still opening up portals or gateways to the netherworld in all of these haunted locations? And of course, you're not closing them. You're just walking out the door and, you know, and just going, okay, come and go as you please. Do you think that's going on? Oh, uh, yeah, it's actually worse. And that's why you have to be careful with, um, with certain sigils and certain, um, these, these sigils are in the phone. In other words, they've, um, if you open up your if you open up your cell phone, there's there's sigils, and I know this is going to sound a, a bit nutty, but the the type of technology that we have would have been considered magic a few hundred years ago. Mm. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll go back five hundred. We'll go back a thousand years. We'll go back to the Middle Ages. It's it would be considered witchcraft. It would be considered magic, not because of what it can do so much, but how it's achieved. If you were to dissect a smartphone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, the circuitry, the circuit board is configured in such a way that resembles um, sigils. And this mirror, this glass, it, it's, it's all the same as what the, the alchemists were trying to achieve. Uh, we can look at people from around the world. It's like a magic portal. Now people say, oh, it's just science. But... When you look at the metals that we have to use, we have to use these rare earth mm. uh, minerals, yeah, like lithium and cobalt, and you know all kinds of other things. That's magic. That's alchemy. It doesn't matter how you want to try to cope or explain it in a scientific way. It doesn't change the fact that we're taking things out of the earth, we're configuring them in a certain way, we're putting coding in, which is just a spell, to get it to work, and we do these incantations every day. So when you have an app like um. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Randonautica. Randonautica, but, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, and they, yeah. they send people to places and things happen. Yeah. That, that's worse than a Ouija board. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it, I've seen some videos that, that are very, very bizarre. And they, the locations that keep, people get sent to, it, it, it kind of, it, it, they don't make sense. But they're also, at the same time, some people get very, very freaked out and spooked by been in those places now that yeah. could be psychological but uh i i don't think i could i don't think i could do that i've been curious i've been curious you know because it's almost like instant content you know it's like do it film it all that kind of stuff and i and i may brave it i i have no evidence to suggest that it's worse than a ouija board i kind of i put that out there more just in the sense that if you're using a ouija board in the in the safety of your own home Yes, you could be cursed. Yes, something might happen. You might open up a doorway. You might invite a, uh, a hostile spirit. But when you do randonautica, you're driving. You're more vulnerable. You're going on a private property. Yeah. You're 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 susceptible yourself to the elements, uh, things like that. You might fall in a hole. You know, you might get more dangerous as far as what I can perceive, which is that it 
puts you into a, a more state of randomness. There's more variables. So talking about being outside and going places, um, one of my questions I wanted to ask you was, where do you think all these people are going in, in, the, in, our, in the national forests? Where do, you, where do you think they're vanishing to? Are they being, are they, you know, are they falling out of time? Are they skipping across a portal or is, are, they, are they just being unlucky and getting attacked by animals? I think some of them are, are just, they're, they're being attacked by animals. We can obviously chalk some of it up to that. Just to, or statistically, that's, you know, obviously some of these people that are quote unquote disappearing are probably being eaten by animals, but the ones where they find their clothes neatly folded and no trace of blood or bone or hair, um, I actually like to think just being an optimist and being, you know, I, I like to think that they found something better and they just don't want to come back. Here in California, we have Mount Shasta. I don't know if you've ever done any research into Mount Shasta, but um, Mount, Shasta, Ma Mount Shasta is considered one of the most spiritual places on earth. Um, it's to, to the point where a lot of Westerners um, will go to India and they'll go to Tibet and they'll go to Nepal and they'll go to talk to the, the gurus and the wise men the, um, and they'll, they'll say, oh, I'm from California. And they'll, they'll laugh at them and they'll say, why are you here? And they say, well, we came to the Himalayas, we came to Tibet, we came to seek enlightenment, to seek you know this and that. And they'll say, go back to California, go to Mount Shasta. That's, that's a, a more sacred place than here. So when you look into the history of Lemuria, the lost continent of Lemuria, mm -hmm. the story is, is that when Lemuria fell, the inhabitants fled east towards uh, what's now California, and they inhabited Mount Shasta. And in Mount Shasta, and this is a proven fact, there is um, unmapped tunnels, there's caverns, there's a whole network, and nobody's been able to map all of them. In other words, they haven't been able to explore the a hundred percent of them. So there's a lost city of Telos, which is T E L O S. And it's a mythical city that is supposedly inhabited by an ancient race of people who live underneath Mount Shasta. And there's been people who've, who've gone to look for it and, and so forth. So yes, um, the, the, the exploration of the outdoors could be attributed to that, that the disappearances could be attributed to inner earth. In other words, I like to think that maybe some people found it and they found their, you know, um, I wouldn't say calling, but they, they were, maybe they were lucky. Maybe they were um, brought in by these people and they just live in there now. Ah. With, with the outdoors and people vanishing and people disappearing, we, mm -hmm. we have other phenomenon uh, out in the, the great forests. Uh, of course, I, I, I've have to mention it because, you know, I always do. Um, Bigfoot. Now, Bigfoot's in the news, always in the news. There's always something about Bigfoot, someone seeing, you know, a big creature where they were driving home or going out for a walk or whatever. Um, do you think there is a, a paranormal aspect to this kind of phenomenon? Well, I would, I would classify the, the Bigfoots and the, the Sasquatches and the, the Yetis and the abominable snowmen, all that kind of stuff. I would say it's paranormal in the sense that it's, you know, it's outside of normal. You know, it's not uh -huh. necessarily spiritual or supernatural. I don't think that they're um, spiritual beings. I think that they they're they're mortal. They have a lifespan. They can be killed. You know, by any by any means as a human. But I would say yes, it's 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 paranormal in the sense that it's it's uh, crypto, you know, cryptozoology. Yeah. So I would put it in the I would put it in the category of paranormal. But I wouldn't put them in the category of supernatural or or spiritual necessarily. Uh, um, interesting. They they may or may not. I haven't had any experiences with cryptos. I haven't had any experience with uh, skinwalkers or um, uh, manitous or any any of those kinds of things. Have you um, ever been out for a walk somewhere, maybe in the woods? Uh, open land and it can be anywhere just somewhere away from people and buildings and you've had that moment where everything seems to go quiet and you feel very aware 
of yourself and as if you're being watched. Have you ever had those moments? I have had those moments. I've had those moments and I've I've had the experience of the sudden uh, cold breeze, a sudden drop in the temperature, the yeah. chilling kind of effect. And I've I've heard strange noises, but I've never I've never seen anything physical in the woods. I've heard things, I've things have followed me. Whether it could have been a, a mountain lion or it could have been, you know, something like that. Um over here in California, we call them mountain lions. Yeah. Uh, some people call them pan- some people call them panthers, uh, but they're the same thing. Uh, they're large cats. Um, been followed by one, uh, a large one could have killed me easily. But I think my spirit was clean, and I wasn't too afraid of it. But as far as um, be- feeling like I've been followed for sure, but not seeing what was following me, and feeling like I've been watched, but not seeing what's watching me. And, um, I, but I, I also feel like I've had, I've had some boons. I've had some, some gifts. Um, I was on the beach one time and it was really, really cold and I couldn't get a fire started. There was no, there was no wind Mm -hmm. and, uh, didn't have any accelerant, didn't have any petrol or kerosene. And I had this tiny little ember going. And then all of a sudden it was, there was no wind. And then all of a sudden this huge gust of wind came. I mean, massive, just, and the fire just sparked, right? It was roaring and the kindling caught and it was a roaring blaze and it kept me warm out on the beach. And then the wind, it dissipated, but it, it just, it came in right at the nick of time. So I feel like the, the God or the, the spirit of God or somebody was looking out and just said, let's give this guy a break. Let's give him a little gust of wind to get his fire going and i explained that to my father and he said yes absolutely that was a gift it's uh there's a lot of people out there that have these um moments and you 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 think it it, you know you could say oh it could be just uh could be just luck you know it could just be one of those things but there's so many people that have these things happen you think you look at the odds and you you kind of weigh it up and you think possibly there's something going on there Maybe you know. Maybe there is something going on there. It's very, it's very strange. It's very strange. But um, anyway, so we're 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 kind of rapidly coming to the end of this episode. But I cannot end this episode without picking your brains a little bit about everything mm-hmm. that's in the news right now. And of course, everything that's in the news right now is uh, UFOs and uh, aliens. I'm just wondering, have you ever stepped into that realm? I mean, I've done my research into UFOlogy. And the UFO cults like Heaven's Gate and you know other things like that. And when I was a child, I I found it more interesting. But um, I honestly don't believe in aliens. Um, I'm not a believer in aliens. I believe in demons, interdimensional uh, shape shifting. You know, demons are what I think people attribute to uh, aliens. Uh, when you look at the when you look at the quote unquote science of the thing, it doesn't really make any sense. Um, because we're told that the the nearest possible inhabit uh, inhabitable planet would be light years away, and it would take this much time going at the speed of light. You think about molecular structure breaking down at that at such a rapid speed. It just doesn't. To me, it doesn't make any sense. And I know that some people will have a hard time believing that there's no intelligent life out there. But what's the chances of our civilization being advanced enough to understand an advanced race, and then also another advanced race? thousands and thousands of, of millions of light years away also having the technology and then we, we happen to converge at, the, at this nexus at this exact same time like to me it just doesn't add up and you know I believe in God and identify as a Christian so forth so to me it just I believe that humans are the most advanced life in, in all of existence and I'm not even completely soul on the concept of a universe, because how do you have a vacuum without a container? In other words, if the if the universe is expanding, then how is there what we have? I think we live in a contained uh, creation. For all we know, we could be uh, in a petri dish some on some shelf somewhere. No, nah. see that. I mean, I you you can have that opinion. I respect that you have, but to me, that that goes against. My, my my belief it goes against my faith. I think that we were created intelligently 
and that we are the most um, advanced and um, we are the stewards of the earth. Nature isn't our God. We are the controllers of nature. So, okay, let me let me flip this on 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 its head. Okay, I, I just want to I just want to try this because I want to I really want to get your opinion. Uh, what if? Um, okay, so UFOs, aliens are are not a they're not they're not organic in the sense of flesh and blood or bone or whatever, and they're, they're machines that they travel in are not uh, made. Okay, they're not materialistic. But what if? What if, if you go back to maybe uh, the scriptures, the Bible, and you say, okay, well, maybe what people are seeing are what people saw 2,000 years ago. Maybe they, and they thought that then what they were seeing were angels, demons, gods, flighting about in the sky. What's your take on that? We have accounts of the watchers, you know, the Nephilim, the the ones whose job was to watch us, and we see that a lot with the UFOlogy. They feel like they're being visited, they're being contacted by these people, and they're, like there's stories in the Old Testament that of uh, of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, they're visited by two angels, and the angels are represented as humans. They put themselves in human form to see if anybody would take them in, because. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was full of uh, very rude people, and Lot took the took the angels in, and all the people wanted to come in and meet these people, these mysterious guests. And then the angels warned Lot and his family that you know that Sodom was going to be destroyed, and to leave, and they did. And you see that with ufology, you see people who what they refer to as contactees mm-hmm. being visited by. Uh, Malevolent, you know, friendly spirits or friendly aliens, and saying, "Hey, something bad's going to happen. You should leave." And then they do, and then something bad, and they're spared because they took the advice of these these friendly aliens. Well, same thing. It's it's almost like you could take any aspect of of angels Uh. or 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 guardian angels, anything like that, uh, spirit helpful spirits, and then you could overlay that with some people's experience with quote unquote aliens. It's that there's ones that that help, and then there's ones that are bad. And um, a lot of the uh, abductions where they get examined, you know, the, the invasive kind of um, probings and mm-hmm. so forth. Well, that's that runs on par with people's experiences with what they've perceived as being possessed by demons. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I suppose you could. There are parallels, aren't there? If you if you yeah. put them together. There are parallels. You could, they, you, they would cross. There is a crossover. You could say, uh, think those two um, aspects are very similar. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I remember when I was a was a kid. My my dad gave me a, a load of uh, books, and I wasn't really a reader back when I was sort of in my preteens. But one of the books he gave me was, uh, uh, it was a very thick uh, Bible, but it wasn't a Bible in the sense of just text. It was a Bible that was. Uh, it was pict- it was pictorial it was lots of pictures and all of the pictures were uh, descriptions of uh ufos or spacemen or or stuff like that you know it was all done in that way and, and i remember looking at that bible and thinking you know wow what, what what if this was real what if these people who said they saw angels were seeing these people in the sky that were coming down and giving them messages and and it really got me sort of thinking about you know the ufos and and all the other stuff, and I mean, I, I don't. All I'm talking about is from opinion, and 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 it's like those kind of things really get me thinking. When 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 you think about sort of uh, the the universe, the world, what, what however you perceive our reality and and what we live in. So some people some people will tell me we live in a, a computer simulation. This is all a simulation. You know, we are on a hard disk somewhere, and I think to myself. Well, yeah, maybe, but then again, but I feel so real. But then again, if I was in a video game and I was conscious of being in that video game, then to me, that world would be real. So final thoughts, are we in a simulation? No, absolutely not. Um, The simulation theory is something that's always kind of uh, gone under my skin because first of all, if we're in a simulation, then why would the simulation allow us to be aware uh, there should have been aware or or able to perceive such a configuration. In other words, 
if if the if the simulation is so good that it can fool us every day into thinking that we're of flesh and blood and that we die and we rot and all that kind of stuff, then why would it put in the ability to be aware of it? Now, some people will say, oh, that's part of the programming. It's part of a way that it messes with us is it, it allows us to be aware of it and it's looking for the one. You know, the thing is, is that the emergence of that theory directly um, is, is on parallel with that movie with Keanu Reeves called The, the Matrix. Matrix. Yeah. The Matrix. Nobody was talking about The Matrix being real until they watched that movie. Personally, I've seen it about two times over the last you know, 23 years or 20, however long, however old it is now. I'm not a fan, and I'm especially not a fan of people trying to say, oh, we live in The Matrix. It's like the, we're all, you know, we're looking for Neo, we're looking for the chosen one. That's all. It's all that to me. That's a psyop. To me, that's a psychological operation. It's a it's a red herring kind of thing. And so, yeah. Final thoughts. If that's what we're going to close it on, um, I don't know. The simulation's not real, in my opinion. But it's beyond an opinion. It's an educated opinion. Is that it doesn't add up, and it's a new thing. People weren't really talking about that. That you could go back into some quantum physics and and theoretical physics books probably you know maybe in the 60s or the 50s or so maybe some people were kind of laying the foundation for that kind of narrative but to me the uh the, the ancient religions don't support it the ancient philosophies don't support it and there's not a lot of you want to talk about lack of evidence there's some serious lack of evidence there It'd be easier to prove you know, bigfoot or the you know or ghosts or something the, the simulation theory it's 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 actually it's a synonymous with technology increasing. As technology's increased, the um, interest in it because they look around and they think that these are aspects of that simulation. Well, that was, uh, um, yeah, I I I, uh, I kind of agree with you in a way um, that uh, we so much to talk about. Um, I, I just think that there's definitely going to be a part two to the, there's going to be another Paratalk episode, uh, with old scary world, because I, th I think we've only just, uh, we've only just sort of, uh, hit the, 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 the tip of, uh, topics that we can delve into. Um, totally fascinating. I, I have to, I have to say what, what a great, what a great conversation. And I'm, I'm sure Thank my you. listeners would be, uh, in agreement with me, but, um, for you, anyway, uh, as I say, before you disappear, what's um, what are your plans for your uh, YouTube? Have you got anything coming up? Yeah, as far as the YouTube channel is concerned, I've been um, I've been kind of held up with some uh, some legal uh, disputes, uh, separate from social media, just personal things. And uh, I recently, you know, started a family uh, a couple of years ago with my wife, and uh, so I've been really focused on raising our daughter and um, just doing things I have to do. I haven't even put 100% into my YouTube channel. This is actually me doing it as a, as a means of survival in the sense that I need an external outlet. When certain things are resolved within the next couple of months, I plan on putting a lot more effort, uh, creating a lot more content and going and doing more on location. I've done a few on location videos where I visited certain areas of interest. So. As far as the YouTube channel and the Instagram are concerned, yeah, I would say my plans are to travel uh, a little bit more and do more on location uh, filming instead of just going off of uh, historical photographs. Well, what all I can say is thanks for coming on to Paratalk. It's been a, a fascinating conversation. You're definitely coming back at some point uh, yeah. because there's so much more to talk about. I think uh, we're going to have to sort of, uh, you know, the the the, the topic it tip, topics are endless really but um i hope everybody uh, out there listening to this enjoyed it as much as i did um once again yeah thanks for coming on it was great and thanks for having me that's quite all right and until next time talk to you soon mm -hmm.